Revelation. Understanding the book of Revelation. I'm excited. Anybody excited? You guys are obviously excited because you're here. I appreciate you guys being here. Let's get into it, huh? Because it's it's heavy and it's deep and it's going to require us to be like, ooh, get our mind right. Let's do some basic um, review. Go ahead and give me a slide. Let's first remember that there is a chaotic structure to the book of Revelation. So as you will find your self looking at the screen, you find the same things written in the first section. Now, this is not the first chapter. There are 22 chapters and they are divided into divisions. Last week we talked about what division? Uh, give me a slide real quick. I believe last week we talked about division. No, not that one. Give me the one after that one. We, we talked about division one and that was about the church on earth and the church in eternity, right? That's, so that was our first division. And as you guys remember, uh, show me that last slide that we just saw. Revelation is a big giant teaching of Christ going into the tabernacle, right? So the tabernacle, we got the candlesticks, he's moving through the sanctuary and he is offering an atonement for our sins. All right, go ahead and give me another slide real quick, just so we can see that. Now, this is what we are covering this week. We have to cover this before we actually get into the reading because it's like a puzzle and it won't make any sense. If you don't know it's a puzzle, you're going to not understand it as you're reading. And if I said, hey, check out this puzzle, you're ready to solve it. You're like, okay, let me put this together with that. Boom, Let's snap all these pieces together and it's ready to go. If you didn't know that it was a puzzle, you would say, man, what's wrong with this picture? It's all broken. And that's how Revelation is. All right, so in the second division, which we are discussing tonight, we have the judgment in heaven and the judgment on earth. That's what is discussed in this division. We're gonna take a look at some things that are only written in the beginning of Revelation and the end of Revelation and nowhere else in the Bible. Now, when we find multiple things in the Bible, those things are called precepts, right? We're gonna be taking a look. Um, go ahead and give me a slide. We're gonna be taking a look at, and there's a lot of my, I tried to make that so that you guys, oh, you can kind of see it. Okay, write this part down. We're gonna be taking a look at 11. I had to, I tried to figure out how can I make this so that you guys can see it clearly, but without it being too much to look at, all right? Let me give you the divisions. You need to write this part down. Whew. The division of judgment covers Revelation chapter four, verse one, all the way through Revelation eight, one. Those are the sections of Revelation that's talking about the judgment. And Revelation 19:1 through Revelation 20, verse 15, are also talking about the judgment. So this is, this is very important. Got it? All right. You guys ready? Let's take a look at some of these chiasms. Now, once you see the preset, you waiting for me to step out of the way so you can take, I can send this to you guys if you would like. Also, I can post this. This is just a quick breakdown of some of the scriptures that we're going to be looking at that will show you the chiasm and how it must be precept upon precept. The first one we're gonna be looking at hmm, is the open door in the sanctuary. Now remember, all of these things are happening according to the tabernacle. Moses created the tabernacle on earth, but in the book of Hebrews, it says that God told him to make it after the pattern of everything that he saw in heaven. So there is a tabernacle on the earth and there is a tabernacle in heaven. Okay, let us begin. Revelation chapter four, verse one. What we're doing, just real quick so you guys can understand, I'm showing you the puzzle because without seeing the puzzle, you won't understand how to read this book. It is not written in chronological order. It's an anomaly. Here we go. Revelation four, one, it says, 
After this, I looked. Now, you guys are looking for similar wording and concepts so that you can see that the thing from the beginning is the thing at the end. After this, I looked and behold, a door, here it is, was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. So John is seeing, man, this, I do my best. To, this is a complicated subject. So I'm going to sh show you guys that John the Revelator is seeing in both of these two sections of Revelation. He's going to see that heaven is opened. He's going to see God sitting on his throne. He's going to see a great multitude. He's going to see the white horse that the Antichrist is on and the white horse that uh, Christ is on. And those, all of those things that I just mentioned are only found in these two sections of Revelation. That's how we snap together the pieces of the puzzle. So I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. So this starts with the judgment. The door has to be opened in heaven. Let's take a look at the mirror. You guys remember that this is a mirror image, right? Kind of like you got you to gotta see it here and the mirror image is at the end. So Revelation 4, take me to Revelation 19 verse 11 and we're going to find the same wording it says and i saw heaven opened so we saw the heavens open at the beginning of revelation and we see them open here at the end of revelation and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war he is able to see that in the beginning what do we see john saw the heavens open at the end of revelation what happens the heavens are opened again. Okay, that's what we're looking for. It's a mystery that we are going to solve. Let's take a look at the second thing. Two, the throne. It's going to say the exact same thing. This is how you find the precepts. You're looking for scriptures that say the same thing. But as it says the same thing, it reveals more information. Revelation chapter four, verse two, it says, and immediately I was in the spirit and behold, now take a look at this wording. A throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. That's what it says at the beginning of Revelation. Let's take a look at the mirror. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. In the beginning of Revelation, he sees a throne. And at the end of Revelation, he sees a throne and him that sat on it. From whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them okay you guys are starting to see it right puzzle starting to get a little clearer like man there's a throne why is there this throne here because there's also a throne there because the things that we find in the bible the things that we teach they are on three levels anybody remember what levels they're on there's a right there's a spiritual level a mental level and a physical level to all these things that are written in the Bible. And Revelation is amazing because you get to see all of those things taking place at the same time. All right, check this out. Now it's gonna start to get a little more deep. Let's talk about the great multitude because he sees a great multitude at the beginning and the precept is also a great multitude in heaven. Give me Revelation chapter seven, verse nine. He says, and after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So that great multitude of people, oh man, that's... I'm almost at a loss for words like you guys it's like one of those things either you see it or you don't watch let me show you that's the great multitude of people they're standing before the throne now let me show you the mirror in Revelation 19 verse 1 the Bible says and after these things I heard a great voice of much people that's a multitude isn't it watch this in heaven saying hallelujah did you know that hallelujah is with an a and not with an h yeah Interesting. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Jump down to verse 6. Because the chiasm spans across multiple scriptures. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a 
great multitude as of the voice of many waters. That great multitude is us, right? We're singing hallelujah to the king. His voice sounds like many waters. And when we all sing together, our voice sounds like many waters, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. And as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering sang the same thing it said in the beginning. That's weird. No, hallelujah <laughs> for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. You guys see it? Bring the beat down just a touch. Omnipotent means all powerful, right? So God is omniscient, omnipotent. That means like he's all powerful, all knowing, all, he's the almighty. Okay, now here we go. What about the martyrs? This is what's weird. There's martyrs at the beginning of Revelation and there's martyrs at the end of Revelation and nowhere else in the book of Revelation. Because when we get into this section of Revelation, it has to be a mirror image. It doesn't work with a scroll. See, the Bible is designed to have a mirror image. You can have half on the left and half on the right. And then usually, you guys ever seen these things in your Bible? The, the, the little markers, you use that to split the Bible down the middle so that you can understand the mirror image to the right and the mirror to the left. Even on the page itself, you have a line of text and then you have a division and then you have another block of text and it's designed to be a mirror. Well, the mirror says that thing which hath been is that thing which shall be and there is no new thing under the sun. No new thing under the sun. And Revelation is proof of that because you see it in the beginning and you see it at the end and it's related. And it teaches you to have a better understanding of the precepts. Now watch here. Let's talk about, you guys know what a martyr is? What is a martyr? Someone who dies for what they believe in. Now watch the wording here because we're gonna find it at the beginning and we're gonna find it at the end. And it's gonna say the exact same thing. What they died for, what made them martyrs, is exactly what we believe here in our church. Now watch this, Revelation 6, 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, the souls of them that were slain. What are they slain for? For the word of God and for the testimony which they held. That's the law and the testimony. The word of God is the law and the testimony. Okay, so they were slain. They were killed because of what they believed. Let's take a look at the mirror of this verse. Revelation chapter 20, verse four says, and I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded, they're martyrs. What were they martyred for? For the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. It's literally the other one said, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. And on this one, it says for the, te for the, you guys see, it's a complete, oh man, I don't know, Renee, they're not, they're not vibing with me. This thing is fantastic. Look, they were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. That's the testimony. And for the word of God, that's the law. They're even in the reverse order to make the mirror perfect. And which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark, upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. All right. There's some very curious wording in the beginning of Revelation and it's echoed at the end of Revelation. It says, because you guys remember, the chiastic structure has to have a climax, right? So it'll say the same thing in the beginning of the chiasm as it does at the end. And a similar thing here, similar thing here. And it's building towards one line and that one line is the climax. So we're starting to find things that say exactly the same thing at the beginning and exactly at the end because we are looking for the climax. So watch this, give me Revelation chapter six, verse 10. The Bible says, and they, crowd with the, and they cried with a loud voice saying, what are they saying? How long, O Lord, holy and true, Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Okay. How long do you not judge? How long are you just going to sit there and not judge these people, Lord? 
and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth. Okay, let's take a look at the mirror because the climax has to be the judgment. He has to judge. Okay, so let's take a look. Revelation chapter 19, 2. The Bible says, for true and righteous are his judgments for he hath judged. Now we're seeing the other side of the mirror. He hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt, what? The earth, that's exactly what it said before, with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. You see, the scriptures are saying the same thing. You'll never understand the Bible until you understand the precepts, because it must be written, read, taught, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. You are looking for scriptures that have similar wording. And then literally the best thing you could do is to take a pen. And when you find, like when I tell you that verse uh, 10 is a precept for 19 verse two, you go into Revelation chapter six, verse 10, and you write the number of the precept right next to it. And then you go to Revelation 19, 2, and you write the number of the precept right next to it. So you are connecting the dots in this, in, in this, in the Bible. Does that make sense? This is how you learn the Bible. This is how you prove things to people. This is how you teach the Bible. And without doing this, you won't understand. Okay. In this section of the judgment, some stuff has to start taking place. There's some seals. Anybody? What, what is it that's sealed? A book is sealed. That's interesting because in the beginning of Revelation, a book is sealed. But at the end of Revelation, it literally says, and the books were opened. So we've reached our climax. He's judged. That's the, 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 the chiastic structure of this is the judgment. We found a scripture that says, how long before you judge? Then we found out, okay, he's judged and avenged our blood. Okay, now we gotta see that there's a book that gets inserted into the story and it's sealed. And then all of a sudden at the end of this story, we find out that the books are open. Let's take a look at that real quick, watch this. Now this is gonna take a few more scriptures for you to understand. Revelation chapter five, verse one, it says, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Okay, now, you guys know the difference between a scroll and a book, right? A scroll, you only write on one side of the page and you roll it up. So what, does he see a scroll in the right hand? He does not see a scroll. See, the King James Bible developed from being written on papyrus, right? In a scroll form to being a book. And he saw a book. It does not say he saw a scroll. It says that this book is written on the front side and on the back side. So what does this book have? It has pages. Okay, so check it out. It says written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. So the book cannot be opened, right? Well, nobody knows what's in the book. You guys gotta see this part. Nobody knows it and nobody understands it. Why is that? Nobody can open it to learn from it. So nobody knows. Everybody knows about this book. Man, you seen that book? That book is amazing. I wish I knew what was in it. It's sealed. Nobody knows what's in it. We just all heard that there's this amazing book. Okay, give me verse two, chapter five, verse two. And I saw a strong angel. He must have been buff because angels got to be strong just off top. But this one, he must have been like swole because he looked strong, right? And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Verse three, and no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Verse four says, and I wept much. Now this is John, the revelator. And when he sees that there is a book in the right hand of him that sits on the throne and there's nobody worthy to open it up, he starts to cry. Okay. 
He says, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Verse five. And one of the elders saith unto me, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book. How many times has it said open the book in this section? Open the book, open the book. Nothing's gonna happen until you open the book. You cry because the book is not open. Stop crying, he's about to open the book, okay? And to loose the seven seals thereof. Verse six, and I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as, as it had been slain. Okay, so it looks like a lamb that's been slain. That should take us all the way back to the tabernacle picture. The picture of the tabernacle because the lamb that is slain is a sacrifice given to God. This lamb is Jesus. Okay, but in the tabernacle, the lamb gets slain on the outside. And then the priest comes in and only thing he brings in of that whole lamb is what? The blood. And he sprinkles the blood. He has to open the door. That's where this story started at. Oh, there was a door open. He has to walk through the door and sprinkle the blood on the veil at the Holy of Holies. And that's how the high priest makes an atonement for our sins. Okay. Whew, man. So now there is, he sees in the middle of everybody, a lamb that looks like it was slain having seven horns and seven eyes. Jesus has seven horns and seven eyes? Wait a minute, what are those? It says, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Yeah, Jesus does have seven horns and seven eyes because those seven horns and seven eyes represent seven spirits of God. You guys wanna see the spirits? All right, let's take a look, give me a precept real quick, Isaiah chapter 11, verse two. If you don't read the Bible precept upon precept, you'll never find the seven spirits of God. Because even though it's mentioned a couple more times in the book of Revelation, he does not tell you what they are in Revelation. If you're one of those uh, believers who only believes in the New Testament and you don't read the Old Testament, you will never know what the seven spirits of God that he's referring to are, because guess where they're located? In the Old Testament, they're they're located in the law. Okay, watch this. Isaiah chapter 11, verse two. Let's count them real quick. Uh, give me verse one, just so you guys can see who it's talking about. Watch this, it says, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Who's Jesse? That's David's dad. Okay, that's King David's dad. Now, we read in Revelation that he was the the root of David. Okay, and it clearly says a branch. That's a capital B, isn't it? That's a name. Who's the branch? Jesus is the branch. Watch this, verse two. Let's count them. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. How many spirits is that? Those are the seven spirits of God that were sent forth into all the earth. If you don't do the precepts, you'll never know it. That right there is not written anywhere else in the Bible. Okay, take me back to Revelation real quick. So it says, Jesus has these seven spirits. Let's take a look at the mirror because that mirror, what we saw in that whole section is there was a book that needed to be opened, <laughs> right? Okay, give me Revelation chapter 20 verse 12 so we can take a look at the mirror image of this book getting open it says and I saw the dead small and great stand before God why are they standing before God this is a judgment and this division of the chiasm in Revelation that we're looking at is all about judgment it says I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works you see the books in the beginning of revelation 
But they're sealed, huh? But the lamb is worthy to open them. So what are the precepts for that? Oh, well, I have to go all the way to the end of the story to find out what happens when this book gets open. Because immediately after, in the beginning of Revelation, it doesn't tell me about the opening of the books. It tells me about the loosing of the seals. And the loosing of the seals is all bad, right? That's, that's bad on the earth. I want to find out, what does he do after he opens the books? Okay. Well, now I can clearly see. The dead are judged out of those things that are written in the books. All right. Watch this now. I'm not going to hold you guys too long. We're at point number seven. I, I did my... The, the book is literally filled with these things. I just had to pick out as many as I could in the hour that I had to put together the message. And I pulled out 11 of them. That doesn't mean there's only 11. There are hundreds of these things. I just want to show you some of them have the exact same wording, but a mirror version. Watch this. Redeemed. Okay. In the beginning of Revelation, we acknowledge that Christ redeemed us to be priests so that we could reign with him. At the end of Revelation, after the resurrection, we are resurrected to be priests so that we can reign with him. Let's take a look. The first part, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. The Bible says, And they sung a new song, saying, Worthy, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast, look at that word, redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So we're redeemed in that verse. Give me verse 10. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign. Where are we going to reign at? Nah, some people think we're going to reign in the stars somewhere. He clearly says we're going to reign on the earth. Ain't that right? Okay, let's take a look at the mirror and find out if the mirror tells us that we're somewhere next to Jupiter now. Watch this. Give me Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. The Bible says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. The first, you have to be redeemed before you can stand in the resurrection. Okay? On such, the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God. Isn't that what it said we was going to be earlier? We're going to be priests. Okay? And of Christ, and they shall, wait, what they going to do? Reign with him a thousand years. A thousand years in outer space? A thousand years on the earth, we will reign with Christ. You guys are seeing the precepts snapping together. This is how the structure works. All right. Let's talk about that um that white horse. Who has to come before Jesus can come? You, you guys know? Jesus is not coming back tomorrow. You guys know that, right? That's not. He's not coming back tomorrow. I can say that for a fact. Because somebody has to come before he comes. Who's coming before Jesus comes? The Antichrist. Yeah, he has to come and reveal himself to the world. And who does he look like? Who's he act like? He wants, see the, the mirror image of Revelation is meant to show you how Satan is trying to be a mirror image. The Antichrist is a mirror image of Jesus, but he's just wicked. <laughs> he's just wicked, right? So he has to come before Jesus can come. Bible literally says he has to be revealed okay so check this out well if Jesus decided that he was gonna roll into Phoenix in a Mercedes Benz the Antichrist would have to get him a Mercedes Benz too whatever is written about Jesus and what he's going to do the Antichrist has to copy it and make a mirror image of it so that people can be deceived Okay, so watch this. Um, Revelation chapter 6, verse 2. Now, soon as they open the first seal off the book, the Antichrist says, that's my time. The book is not even completely open yet. But he's already down there trying to convince people that he's Jesus. It says, and I saw, hmm, and behold, a white horse. Now, watch the exact wording. A white horse and he that sat upon him. Isn't that what it says? Okay. had a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer all right let's take a look now 
That's the first one. He comes first. Let's see who comes at the end of Revelation for the judgment. Give me Revelation 19, 11. And I want you to look at the exact wording. It says, hmm. And I saw heaven open and behold, watch, a white horse and he that sat upon him. See, those, those are not typos when the Bible says the exact same thing in multiple places. That's meant to let you know this scripture is related to another scripture. They say the same thing, right? And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. That's Jesus. So that first one who came rolling through on the white horse, that was the Antichrist. He's going to deceive the whole world. Anybody who's not keeping the precepts of God, they're going to see the heavens open and they're going to be like, what's that coming in the sky? That must be Jesus. And, and let me tell you the specific group of people. It's not everybody. We're not going to fall for it. But there is a specific group of people who don't believe that the Jesus of the Bible is the Messiah. But they believe that a Messiah is coming, right? This group of people, they do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but they do believe that the Messiah is coming. So this is actually Jewish people. You guys know that Jewish people do not believe in Jesus, but they do believe that a Messiah is going to come and deliver them. And they are going to be sadly deceived because they're going to see a Messiah coming in the sky. And this Messiah is not coming to bring war. This first one that comes, he's coming in peace. That's how he's going to deceive all of them. They're waiting for the first coming of Christ. We're waiting for the second coming of Christ, right? So they're going to be deceived and they're going to follow this false Christ, this antichrist that comes. We're going to be like, nah, nah, the, the party don't jump off until after he gets revealed. <laughs> right? That's, we need to see the one who's called faithful and true. That's the one we want to see. And that's interesting. Both of them are rolling in the same vehicle, ain't there? Both of them come on a white horse. All right. Death and hell. Death and hell. You would think, man, the Bible talks about death and hell all over the place. Not death and hell together. Like death and hell are homies and they roll together. They roll together in the beginning of Revelation. And then they roll out at the end of Revelation, right? Watch this. Let's take a look. Give me Revelation chapter 6, verse 8. This is the opening of another one of those seals. It says, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him. See? They're homies. They roll together. They're roll dogs. <laughs> Wait. One of them's name is Death, and he's got a friend named Hell. Hell follows him. Hell is not on a horse, right? Death is on the horse. You guys ever heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse? That's what this story is. It's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But apocalypse means revelation, okay? It does not mean destruction and end of the world. Like you see those movies come out and they'll be like, apocalypse now. That doesn't mean, it doesn't mean destruction. It means revelation. What is being revealed? The truth is being revealed. The Antichrist has to be revealed the same way Jesus has to be revealed. All right. So we got two new characters. We got one named Death and we got one named Hell. Okay. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Let's take a look at the mirror because they just rolled in together. And God says, at the end of this story, y'all going to roll out together. All right, Revelation 20, verse 13, the Bible says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and his homie that he hangs out with named Hell. This is the only places in the Bible that these words are grouped together, in the beginning of Revelation and at the end of Revelation. That's how you know it's a precept. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged. That word keeps coming up because this division in the Bible represents the judgment of God, okay? And, and, and they were judged every man according to their 
works. Watch, give me verse 14. Let's find out what happens. It says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You guys with me? Some people, some people who don't believe in the precepts, they believe that's just a coincidence that the first time that it mentions death and hell together is at the beginning of Revelation and the last time is, it's just a coincidence, Pastor. No, no, there's no such thing as coincidence. It doesn't, it doesn't happen like that. Let's talk about the second coming of Christ because we talked about that just a little bit. See, these are some of the things that you have to know before you even start really digging in and writing your notes for the book of Revelation. Somebody will ask you at some point and they're gonna say to you, Hey, you know, Jesus is coming soon. And you're like, not as soon as you think, <laughs> not as soon as you think, but he is coming soon. And they're like, what do you mean? Well, the antichrist has to be revealed before Jesus can come. The fullness of the Gentiles, it has to be complete. These things are written and verified and confirmed. They're on a timeline. They'd be like any day now. No, it's not any day now. You don't even know what you're watching for. I was asking some people, I said, um, how do you know when the great tribulation starts? I asked two different people who both go to this church and they both gave me the same answer and both answers were wrong. <laughs> so I retired. I was like, I'm not going to be the pastor here anymore. I'm just going to be a janitor or something and yell out answers from the back of the room occasionally. All right, man. All right. Let me tell you when the great tribulation starts. It is not when the trumpet blows. If you are waiting for the trumpet to blow, you will be late. The great tribulation starts when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. That's the time when the Bible says, let him that is on the rooftop not come down to take anything out of his house. What does that mean? You got to go. That means you have to flee immediately when you see that take place. If you're waiting for a trumpet, you're gonna be late. You're going to show up to the party late like I'm here. And we're like, it's closed already. All right, second coming of Christ. Watch this. Give me Revelation 6. And let's take a look at verse 12. Because in the beginning of Revelation, it describes the second coming of Christ. And because it does it there, it has to have a mirror of it at the end of Revelation. Yeah. And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. Man, y'all know that has to happen right before Jesus comes back, right? Okay, verse 13. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. When Jesus spoke about this, he said, when you see the fig tree and them figs is ripe, then you'll know the time is at hand. Okay. Verse 14. And the heaven, that's the sky, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. The sky, boom, the sky is departed. There's no more sky. Can you even imagine what that's like? Oh, wait, that makes sense. Because at the beginning of this story, I don't know if you guys remember, he said, I saw heaven opened and I saw a throne. The only way you're going to see a throne is if this barrier called the firmament has been removed. And now there is no longer a separation and we can look right up there and be like, wait, you was up there the whole time, Jesus? <laughs> You've been watching me? I saw the throne. How did you see the throne? The sky got rolled together and it's removed. Okay, I'm getting a little excited. Let me come. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. That's interesting because I remember when he said he's going to take every mountain and make it low, every valley and make it high. He's going to make the crooked places straight. He's going to change. Ev All it takes is one good earthquake to do that whole thing right there. Yeah. Watch this. Give me the next verse. Verse 15. And the kings of the earth... And the great men, kings, great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, 
Did anybody pay attention to how many different types of men was in there? Y'all was just reading, huh? You just reading or listening to me read? When you are reading through there, you need to be like, wait a minute. Why is he listing off all these different types of people? Well, one, he's going to list them off here. So he has to list them off again at the end of it. But let's just take a look. So he says, um, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, every bond man, every free man. Why does, why does he say six different types of men? Because six is the number of man. You, you guys probably could have guessed that there was going to be six in there before we even started counting because he says, man, 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 man. What'd they do? They hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Let's keep going. Verse 16. And said to the mountains and rocks, these men are now talking to inanimate objects. They're talking to the rocks. <laughs> Watch this and said to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne why do they need to be hidden from his face what happened just a few seconds earlier to the sky the heaven rolled together boom and there was no longer a separation and god himself is looking down he is ready to judge and all these men say oh i'm going into this mountain i need you to fall on top of me to hide me from his face i don't want him to see me because i'm a sinner because he's real and i believed he was fake this whole time i haven't kept not one single commandment i've been hating everybody i'm a hater Mountains, please fall on me and kill me because what he's going to do to me is worse. Wow. Hmm, that's interesting. Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? So this whole story that right here is describing what it's like when he comes back. Now watch, give me one more verse. Verse 17. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand okay so that's the beginning of revelation let's let's get some more details on this whole thing we gotta we gotta see heaven open now that we know the heaven has to be open and it rolls away when you're reading revelation and it tells you that the heaven is open you know that it's a precept for what's happening the second coming of christ revelation 19 all the way at the end verse 11 Watch this, it says, and I saw heaven opened and old a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. See the first, the antichrist, the first guy that comes in on the horse, he's not coming for war. You guys know that, right? He's coming and he's throwing up deuces. He's trying to deceive the whole world by using peace. So there's going to be a time of peace on the earth that's going to be crazy. And in the middle of that is when he's going to flip the script and start making all kinds of war. Now, when Jesus comes, he's not, he's not coming back for peace. I'm, a lot of people think they think he's coming back with John the Baptist and he's playing piano. And there's little baby angels flying around, little naked ain't there is no baby angels in the Bible. He's not coming back like that. Dun, 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 dun. Everybody saved. Dun, dun. He's not coming back like that. He's coming back for war. Wow, so we gotta get ready for it, right? We need to know he's not coming back talking about peace, everybody, peace. I accept all of you. He's literally coming back with a sword and an army. Okay, let's get into it. Here we go. Verse 12. Let's see if we can get some revelation on what he's going to look like. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself. Verse 13. The Lord just revealed to me why he has a name written that nobody knows except for he himself. See, when he comes back, so you guys know um, your name is your purpose whatever your name is like uh, let me see the name Gabriel means messenger of L L is the name of God Gabriel Michael means who is like L L is God Mike so your name is your purpose okay now 
You guys know what Jesus' name is, right? It's Jesus, but in Hebrew, it's, right? Yeshua, and it means salvation. So when he comes, or when he came first time, that's what he gave us was salvation. He gave us the opportunity to be saved. When he comes back, he's not even coming with that name. Isn't that interesting? He has another name because he's coming with another purpose. And nobody knows that name because they would try to take his purpose. See, if it was written somewhere in here, the Antichrist would figure out and he would call himself by that name. Does that make sense? Okay, now watch this. He has a name written that nobody knows. <laughs> Man, but he himself. Hmm. Give me verse 13. Watch this. Now it tells you something very curious in verse 13. It says, and he was clothed with a vesture. What's a vesture? A vest. Dipped in blood. You couldn't wash your clothes before you came back, Jesus. Why are you all bloody? He didn't come back for peace. He came back for war. And war is a very bloody enterprise. Right? And his name is called the Word of God. Wait a minute. In the previous verse, you just told me he has a name written that nobody knows except for him. And then you told me that his name is called the Word of God. That means nobody knows the Word of God except for him. See that? Now, the Bible tells us what we know, we know in part. But when he comes, then we will know fully. His name is the Word of God. And nobody knows that except for he himself. Why? Because he is the Word of God. He's going to set everything in order. All right. Give me verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. That's interesting because in the beginning of Revelation, somebody else came. His name was Death and he had some homies with him. But his homie, he had one and his homie was named Hell. When Jesus comes back, he got armies and they have white horses and they're following him. Clothed in fine linen white and clean verse 15 and out of his mouth go with a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress in the fierceness and wrath of almighty god Whew, man, i wish i had more time to explain this whole winepress situation because that's the reason why his vesture is covered in blood. He's drenched in blood because he's been inside the wine press. Now, a wine press, you throw a bunch of grapes in there and you stomp on them. And as you're stomping on them, the grape juice gets all over your clothes. But it also goes down into a vat. And then they take that and they ferment that. And that's how they make wine. That's how he describes what his clothing is like when he comes back because he has crushed so many wicked people it's like someone crushing grapes that's this is not a jesus that they usually tell you about but this is also a jesus that most of them don't know about all right verse 16 come on we got to get back to the chiasm the precepts verse 16 and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written man he got a lot of names when he come back he got a, lay, a name that i don't know but then he has another name called the word of god which Compared to him, I don't know the word of God, right? Nobody knows the word of God compared to him. And then he has another name, and it's written on his vest and on his thigh. So Jesus is styling you guys. Like, look, he probably, he, he's not wearing a hat. He's got a crown. But he probably, boom, it's blinging. And then he's got on a jacket, and it's got his name right there. And it matches because it's boom right there on his, you guys got to see. Dude is coming back fresh, right? High stepping. Mm -hmm right he's coming back and he's got a name written what is the name king of kings and lord of lords man so you we saw a little bit of him being revealed his second coming at the beginning of revelation we saw more of his second coming at the end of revelation all right i got one last one for you guys i know it's deep look these are all the things that you have to get a grasp on before we start to read it when we read it, we will, we're going to be reading it chapter upon chapter, precept upon precept, but we're going to do more jumping around in Revelation than we have in any other book because every single line has a precept for it. 
when you're reading the book of Revelation. So it, it's going to be deep. I have to prepare you guys for it, right? I hope it's working. I hope, I hope it's working. Let's take a look at these wordings, these exact wordings. In the beginning, give me Revelation 16, Revelation 615. I pointed some of these out to you guys earlier. But this one is, this one's, watch this. And the kings, I want that one, kings. And the kings of the earth and the great men, let's put that on our list too. And the rich men, eh, let's not worry about that one. And the chief captains, put that on the list. And the mighty men, put that on the list too. And every bondman, we'll put that on the list. And every free man, which one do we get rid of? The rich man, you know why? It's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that what Jesus said? Okay, now watch. He puts it in this part of the list. Uh, what, let me just finish reading the scripture. Hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Verse 16, we just read this. And said, on, said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Now, let's flip it and see if it don't say the exact same thing at the end of Revelation. Revelation 19, 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. Where's this angel standing? In the sun. What does that mean to you? What does that mean? This, see, this is, this is an example of rightly dividing the word. Is this angel standing on the sun? That's not what it says. People interpret and they say he's standing on the sun. Where's this angel standing? In the sun. What does that mean? There's some sunlight coming down and he's just standing there in the sun. I'm glad that worked because I didn't want to have to explain to you guys how he's standing on the sun because that's that's not what it says in other versions of the Bible that is what it says though you pick up an NIV or an ESV and they'll tell you that this angel is standing on the sun that's gonna be real hard because okay let's not get into it and I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God verse 18 that ye may eat the flesh of kings is that on our list and the flesh of captains is that on our list and the flesh of mighty men that's on our list and the flesh of horses is that on our list nope that's not on our list and of them that sit on them okay that's not on the list and the flesh of all men both free and bond those are on our list right so you can clearly see that he's, this is connected to the scripture that we read before. Without these connections, you're basically looking at a picture that you will never understand. All right, I got two precepts for you and I'm gonna call the worship team. Now, division one, as you're reading Revelation, I want you to go home and read Revelation, okay? You will have a blessing. It literally says, blessed is he that readeth. So you go home and you read Revelation and you can expect to receive a blessing. It's that simple, right? Okay, but let me show you two precepts about why we're jumping all around in the Bible. Psalms 119 verse 27. Psalms 119 verse 27. Bible says make me to understand the way of thy precepts so shall I talk of thy wondrous works so if you don't understand the precepts you just make up stuff <laughs> you literally you don't get to talk about the the um, amazing things that he's actually going to do you talk about the stuff you think he's going to do right with the precepts you're able to prove watch jump down to verse 93 worship team make your way to the stage Psalms 119 verse 93, the Bible says, I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. Quickened means brought to life. We are brought to life by the understanding that we get from reading the Bible, precept upon precept. Amen? This is the message that we have for tonight.